I was just waiting for the microphone to come on. It's over here. Oh, is it? Oh, sorry. There it is. No. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, standing, we're gonna, I was going to, I have asked uh, my colleague here, Tom Bolio, to uh, give us a little opening prayer. Thanks. Merci, Kevin. Merci, to Jean Charles Clotil, the SC, Kevin, no Palio Tienia, had a Danyas Tihel, and Nulsina, Genyas Tiha, to read Jean. I do a law, no pa, no ni, no ni, no pa, at a light, I see. You know, seen to it, seen it's new to the garnet, no, it's good ni, a rat a light, aha. Mercy, amen. Mercy, Tom. Tom just gave us uh, uh, some opening words there in the Denny Sutlane language, so very much appreciate that. Um, thanks very much for. Uh, coming out this evening. This is a uh, public uh, meeting of the uh, um, Standing Committee on Rules and Procedures. Uh, my name is Kevin O'Reilly and I'm the uh, MLA for uh, Frame Lake. Um, I also chair the committee. Um, I'd like to have the, the committee members uh, introduce themselves uh, just so that we can get going. Uh, Mr. Thompson, would you like to start? Uh, thank you. Mr. O'Reilly, uh, Shane Thompson, and Andy Will Ryden, welcome to our public meeting. Uh, thank you. I'm Tom Bull, the MLA for Tuneda and Willoughby. Thank you for coming. I'm Julie Green, Yellowknife Center. Yes, thank you for coming, uh, Lucy Bert Tabacha. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, we're joined by a couple of uh, our staff here as well. I've got uh, Lee Selleck. Uh, with our uh, research department and uh, uh, Kaylee Thomas, uh, who's the uh, the clerk that's assigned to the committee, and thanks to them uh, for the uh, helping us pull together the thing this evening and uh, for the work that that they've uh, done to get us here. Um, I guess maybe just a couple things I, I would mention before we, we get going. Um, there are uh, some. Uh, do we have the handouts, Kaylee? Uh, sorry, they're right. I can't see them because they're in front of me. Uh, we, there's a uh, short discussion paper there that's a couple of pages, and this material is also available on the Legislative Assembly website. And then the interim report that the committee um, uh, presented in the House back in October is there as well. And, of course, we're, we're gathered here this evening to talk about uh, members' conduct uh, guidelines and uh, associated legislation. I should say, too, that last week we had a... Uh, public meeting in Inuvik, and we had, I think, uh, three or four presentations there. That was uh, last Tuesday evening, and then on Thursday evening, we were in uh, Hay River, and we had, uh, I think, three presentations there in Hay River, and uh, um, this will be the, the last uh, public meeting that we have on the, on the subject, uh, although I understand there's a couple of uh, presentations that we may get on Friday morning, because people weren't able to join us this evening, uh, but uh, and we will be accepting uh, written uh, submissions until December the 20th. Just a, a couple of other administrative matters before we get going. There's a couple of exits. The one that you folks came in, there's another one back here. If for some reason you can't go down there, uh, there's a set of stairs and we, we'll just assemble out front. Um, I think we do have coffee and tea and water at the back. Um, and uh, we can make interpretation services available, but we had no request for that this evening, so we'll be conducting uh, the meeting in English. I just <clears throat> wanted to summarize a little bit of the work that got us here before we get going this evening. Um, in December of last year, uh, all of us as regular MLAs, we signed uh, a conduct or our oath of office, but also um, uh, a conduct guidelines uh, document um, that's uh, available. It was scanned and it's available on, on the Legislative Assembly website. We signed those actually in the House. Uh, there was also a motion uh, passed in the House referring the conduct guidelines to this committee uh, for a uh, public review. And uh, that's the, the, the meeting here this evening. In October, we tabled an interim report in the House that uh, reviewed how conduct in some other jurisdictions is dealt with, including the, the private sector and uh, with NGOs. 
uh, and you'll find some further details in that uh, on that in the uh, interim report. Um, and uh, uh, I mentioned that the, the meetings that we've already uh, held, uh, the written submissions close on December the 20th, and then we expect report uh, back to the House with our final report in early 2017. So the, the sort of issues that we are looking forward to hearing from people on include uh, who can run in a territorial election, what sort of eligibility requirements there should be. There's some basic ones set out in uh, legislation right now. You have to be 18 years old, a Canadian citizen. You have to have resided in the Northwest Territories for a year. And you cannot have been convicted of a major election offence or you're prohibited from running uh, uh, for a five-year period. Um, and that's, that's basically the requirements here in the Northwest Territories. A couple of other jurisdictions have uh, um, uh, some other additional provisions in terms of uh, people that may have uh, um, a serious criminal uh, conviction. Uh, and in, in Nova Scotia, Nunavut, uh, you can be prohibited from running uh, for office. Um, for that, those sort of matters. <clears throat> the, the, there's sort of a patchwork of uh, rules and uh, legislation and uh, that do govern our conduct as MLAs. Uh, there, some of that's found in the Legislative Assembly and Executive Council Act that sets out provisions around conflict of interest in terms of MLAs' uh, uh, financial interests and making sure that that doesn't interfere with their ability to conduct themselves uh, and represent their constituents. I mentioned earlier that we sign an oath of office. We also sign the uh, conduct guidelines. Um, so it's really a bit of a patchwork. There's some other provisions that have been developed by the Board of Management in terms of uh, how we uh, deal with uh, the, uh, our expenses and file claims for those and so on. Um, there's rules for the House as well. But um, in, in our uh, conduct guidelines, there, there are no provisions in terms of enforcement of the guidelines. Basically, there's something called parliamentary privilege, which allows the House to uh, take whatever action it deems necessary at any point in time if uh, they believe that uh, an MLA has not conducted themselves in a proper manner. But it's, so it's basically set up here now as a self-policing system. Some other jurisdictions, though, uh, do have... Uh, a special committee that can uh, investigate matters or hear complaints. Other jurisdictions have uh, an independent uh, officer or commissioner that can uh, um, uh, provide some enforcement of uh, guidelines and so on. So those are the sort of matters that we're here this evening to uh, gather feedback on. And um, I think we're ready to uh, hear anybody who uh, would like to make a submission. The way this will work is uh, there's microphones there. Uh, um, the light will come on automatically. I would ask that you uh, work through me as the chair in terms of uh, making uh, your presentation and wait for the light. And then after you're finished, uh, committee members may have some questions for you so um, of clarification. So we'd uh, ask you to, to remain there and uh, uh, continue to discuss matters with us. But uh, that's how we would like to proceed this evening. So... Uh, I Mr. Wasilsio, I understand that you would like to make some comments. You had, uh, I think, contacted the office beforehand, so. Thanks very much for coming this evening. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I apologize I, for not having a written submission in. Uh, to the committee as of yet. Um, but I just wanted to make some some overarching, I guess, comments about uh, both the discussion guide and about the report that was done. Um, interestingly, I mean, the discussion question is focused, I think, very, on very specific issues around um, specific changes to the code of conduct and some in general. Um, I think that there was a there's a gap in, in sort of what was missed in, in some of that review is uh, one thing I'd really like to highlight to the committee, and it was an issue in the previous assembly, um, although not, not one recently, is right now the, the code of conduct and the member's guidelines really only come into effect once you've taken your oath of office, so about two weeks after the election. Um, however, members start getting paid, of course, the day of the election. So, you know, at midnight that night, successfully winning, uh, getting paid. Um, but if there's any issue of behavior in that interim period, it's not covered by anything. Um, 
it's an interesting piece to note, even federally, um, doing some research, there's some discrepancy about when an MLA or an MP actually becomes an MP. Is it, you know, the night of the election? Is it when the writs are returned? Or is it when um, they're sworn in? And there's some question to that. Um, but I know in a, in a previous assembly, there had been some issues with an elected, uh, a newly elected MLA. And one of the things that came back was, well, no one, no one can do anything about it because they haven't taken the oath of office yet. So none of the guidelines actually have any inf effect. Um, and that was a kind of a surprising response, I think, both for the public um, and just in general, even internally. And I think that's something, it's, it's quite a big gap that hasn't been addressed anywhere in looking at this. And it's something that um, does speak to it, because even if the rules apply now or don't apply, um, frankly, if, if uh, newly elected MLAs are on the payroll and are essentially being MLAs, it, it's surprising that the, the rules don't apply yet. So there's that interim a uh, couple of week period where that gap should be examined. Um, and that's just something I wanted to highlight that uh, didn't appear um, in, in some of the report. Um, the other thing is I just, in looking at them, I think some, some concern uh, came to me looking at the, even the questions and some of the report. Some of it sort of seemed to presuppose that there wasn't ethical behavior going on. And I'd like to, frankly, give Emily and the Assembly and other, other Assemblies the same benefit of the doubt that, generally speaking, the things that happen are, are on the up and up and are, are quite ethical. And continuing the way you do business today continues to promote that. Um, and more can obviously be done, more openness, and we're in this era of openness and transparency and accountability, and these are important things uh, for the House to have. Um, I'd note that the Board of Management recently started having uh, public meetings, which is nice to see. Um, the business of MLAs, such as expenses and stuff, are still not quite open and, and coming along, but more that, that happens along those lines continues it. But I think there should be a default presumption of, of ethical behavior um, by our elected officials. Um, and just, just to, I wanted to touch on a couple of the discussion questions. Uh, with regards to the first one, um, that should a person who's been convicted, uh, committed a serious criminal offense be banned for running uh, for office uh, after the jail time has been served? Um, and I think this is an interesting question, uh, especially because, so once the jail time has been served and the original part of the sentence has been, been served, um, the way our justice system is set up is that, in theory, we've gone through some rehabilitation. There's been a process that happens. Our, our, the Canadian justice system is set up uh, as a rehabilitatory system, not quite like, say, the states, where it's uh, punishment-driven, and, it, and it's based on that. Um, it's funny, on the, on the way here, I was talking to my, my daughter, and I asked that same question, and her response was simply that um, we have to give people a chance to show that they're different and they've changed, and that once they've served a punishment as they've been assigned, um, you know, we have to give them that opportunity and, and let them do that. Um, you know, with the justice system all predicated on that you're not, you know, you're innocent until proven guilty, and that once you've convicted your crime, um, you've moved past that, um, putting restrictions on people's democratic rights and charter freedoms around running and engaging in politics, I think, is a, is a dangerous area to move into, um, judging the relative value of, of particular crimes. Um, you know, does two minor crimes make a major crime? Is it only major crimes? Um, is a one-year restriction better than a one-and-a-half-year restriction versus a two-year restriction? Um, you know, what, what, what that marker is. And I don't think there's any easy answer to it. Um, on that same note, um, you know, there's been study after study that shows the Canadian justice system um, lacks impartiality. Um, a 2013 report by um, former Supreme Court Justice Frank Kikabuchi uh, for the Ontario government, um, the, the former justice basically found that he was shocked by the systemic racism in the justice system looking at Ontario. Um, and he started on just looking at juries, but it had expanded quite a bit. Um, and, I, and, I, and I guess why I bring this up is my concern that if we're using a criminal justice system and then adding on, on punishment to it, but the system has an biases, not individual, but just systemic, um, and we're using that to prevent people from taking part in a democratic process. Um, I don't think that's necessarily fair to anyone else, and certainly not fair to individuals. Um, certainly we can say, you know, there's things you give up by, by committing a crime, um, and I 100% agree with that, um, but the courts obviously assign certain pieces to that, and, and that's not a bad place for that to, to end. Um, Using the same criminal justice system that has biases as a, as a tool to continue to take away, uh, to disenfranchise people from the system um, seems wrong to me. Um, 
especially when we look at, uh, frankly, the, the incidence of, of crime and, and everything else in the territory, we have to look at a, a system that lets, lets us move forward and lets people heal and lets people be a part of the process. Uh, if we have a system that just builds an ivory tower and keeps everybody that's done anything in the past out, I, I don't think that's uh, going to be a good end for the territory. Um, specific to that, uh, or, or just moving on from that, um, specifically, uh, there's been a number of, there was a, quite a bit of discussion around who can run for MLA um, and sort of the rules governing people running. Um, when this committee did a review of the Elections Act, I know that review uh, hasn't come out yet or of the from the previous election. Um, so I think it's a little difficult to, to get into that depending on what other changes are coming. Um, one, one thing of note, though, on this note of... Um, of behavior, uh, the Elections Act often is a complaint-based process for any violations. Um, the, elect, the Chief Elections Officer doesn't have the power to just investigate without a complaint. Um, and that may be something worth looking at to give them that extra power to be able to start their own complaint process and looking into it. Um, you know, right now, uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty high bar to get into, and I don't think in any recent time the Elections Act has been used for serious violations, but um, having a, an Elections Officer that can take that into account uh, certainly wouldn't be a bad thing. Um, beyond that, specific restrictions within the Elections Act, I think right now they line up fairly well with the rest of Canada, and that's not a bad thing. Um, with regards to the member's conduct and specific um, penalties and discipline um, being set out, um, reading the course of the member's uh, guidelines is they're fairly broad in general statements, and I think it'd be very difficult to put specific um, penalties and automatic discipline to those very broad statements. Um, I can see very clearly how it would have to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis, um, depending on, on what exactly has happened. Um, you know, similar right now, there's judicial discretion um, for issues in the courts, um, whether it be a, through a committee of MLAs or whether it be through an independent officer of the ledge um, deciding these things uh, individually, but in an open way. And whether that's, frankly, an open committee process, open discussion, or whether that's something that, that's simply published afterwards with significant justification to, to explain why a particular MLA was, was punished the way they are. Um, looking at the history of the government of the Northwest Territories, there have been a few instances of MLAs um, crossing over the line. Um, in those instances, the, the system that we have in place um, has worked uh, arguably fairly well, but it, it's, it's dealt with the issue as, they, as they've come up. Um, and that's an important thing to remember. I don't think there's been a particular um, issues with the oath of office or with the code of conduct or anything else that haven't been addressed by, by the system. Um, and, and having those automatic penalties, I think, may, may presuppose the, the will of MLAs and parliamentary privilege, as, as you mentioned it, um, to decide these things coming forward. Um, and, and just uh, on, a, on a final note, I think it's important that the ledge continues to promote this transparency and openness. Um, ethical conduct of, of government, um, people presuppose that it's quite low, and I, you know, the opinion of our elected officials in Canada and, and across, you know, across the world isn't always very high. And it... There's no need for that, but it, it is the sort of the, the public opinion. And the, the one thing, I guess, that I would encourage um, or suggest uh, would be just to continue doing what you're doing. The more sunlight that comes into the ledge, the more it gets disinfected and the more openness there is. Um, I don't think there's anything inherently um, ethical going on, but the more you can do to just keep it open, and whether that's, you know, explaining more of the process that you that you follow more of uh, more of the documentation and the reasoning behind things um, often people in the public I think uh, they get outraged when they don't understand why things happened and you know a decision comes out of, out of uh, a legislative body and people get confused as to what drove that decision and that causes some of those concerns so the more about that process that can be open uh, would be the better um, you know, enabling the public to have a clearer understanding of the current rules uh, would be advantageous. Uh, this document's laid it out fairly well, but if you start poking around the ledge website and try to understand what the conflict of interest rules are or try to figure out who's filed what for conflict of interest, um, you can't find any of it. Um, it takes some effort to get it, and it normally involves a trip in here to the library, um, which is great, but it doesn't do you very much good if you live in Polituck. Um, it's pretty hard to get down to the legislative library for any services, so... Um, the more they're going to be put together and published, I think, the better. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had those few brief remarks. <clears throat> oh, great. Thank you uh, very much for your uh, thoughts on this. Um, 
Could I just ask to clarify, uh, Mr. Wassels, you, do, do you intend to file a written submission? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I think that we would find that helpful. Um, I need to clarify at least one thing that I said in my opening remarks was that uh, um, there is one other requirement if you wish to run for office or serve as an MLA, you cannot be incarcerated. And uh, that's written right into the legislation. If uh, you're incarcerated, you're not eligible to run, you're not eligible to serve. And uh, uh, there have been instances in the past where uh, that's played out. Um, and uh, I, you did uh, rightfully point out that, uh, uh, and we, we just mentioned this in our uh, interim report, that uh, um, the Canadian Charter of Rights uh, does... Uh, um, uh, it is a basic right to run for public office in Canada. It, it can be uh, restricted, but th then may be open to uh, uh, challenge in the courts. So, um, in any event, uh, any of my colleagues have any questions for uh, Mr. Wasilsiu on anything he said? Ms. Green, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not aware of the incident you referred to that happened between the time an MLA was elected and the time that he or she was sworn in? Um, was what, what happened at that point? Uh, Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Wassels, you, um, I think it's fair to say that we don't need to name names no. here, but if you could uh, provide us with uh, uh, details, that, that would be helpful in understanding what, what transpired. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, without getting into I guess, personal details of it, there had been an instance where there was a, a newly elected MLA um, had made an offer of, of the government um, in exchange of, of information. Um, and the offer was made, uh, presuming it happened before the swearing-in date of, of the new MLA. Um, it was fairly well covered in the media at the time. Um, and the response from the, from the House at the time had been that um, there couldn't be a conflict of interest, and there couldn't have been a, you know, couldn't have been out of sort because the member, the new member, hadn't actually taken an oath of office, and so wasn't bound by the code of conduct or the conflict of interest code, um, and so there was no determination that way uh, or anything else. But there was generally a sort of a public opinion that uh, there was some line crossing, uh, and it was going a bit beyond. But because of the the timeliness of of, of the offer. Um, it's not there. It's something you can, uh, I'd suggest, that can be found on Google fairly easily. I mean, some of the more of the details and some of the personal back and forth that happened at the time. Um, but it was, it was just interesting to note that um, somebody had come into office and was sort of on the, on the payroll now of being in office, but was un, sort of unchecked. And, and there was nothing to do with, nothing was enforceable based on the rules that would normally govern them in, in position. And uh, part of the arrangement had been that, of course, they had, the newly elected job as MLA. Okay, thanks, uh, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Green? Uh, thank you. Um, it's my understanding that the code of conduct as it exists now would, wouldn't help with that situation because it's an aspirational document without any enforcement or penalties, unlike, say, the Conflict of Interest Commissioner who requires pretty thorough disclosure of, of all assets and debts and, and whatnot. So how do you think the code of conduct would have helped in that situation? Thanks, Ms. Green. Uh, Mr. Rosselsiu? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, the, in that specific situation, the, uh, the exchange of information was, it also involved a, a lawsuit of the governments and a few other things. There was, there was both financial benefit to uh, the, uh, the exchange um, and the fact that the, the very offer in and of itself um, was not the was not probably the most uh, conduct becoming of an MLA and so there was some thought at the time that the code of conduct would have would have applied and there were some questions to the house and to the uh, the premier at the time and um, the response that it the, o the only response that came back was yes it might apply but it it doesn't count right now. Thanks, uh, Mr. Rosselsi. I think that that's helpful, and I recall some discussion of this in the media, so we'll uh, go back and probably do a little bit more thorough digging on it. And I, no, I think you've raised a very interesting point. So, um, uh, Ms. Green, any further uh, questions? Thanks. 
Uh, I'm looking at my colleagues. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Wasilsiu? Um, well, I've got uh, a couple here that I'm, I've been mulling over. So, um, and I, I want to thank you for your uh, view that there's no unethical behavior going on here now. That, that's good to uh, reinforce. <laughs> um, and I do honestly believe that that is the case. Uh, but um, you, you mentioned that, um, you know, one option might be a, a committee of uh, uh, members to uh, deal with uh, perceptions around uh, 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 a breach of the code of uh, conduct uh, or our, our conduct guidelines or some of the jurisdictions have a, a commissioner. Um, do you have any specific advice or thoughts on that, uh, whether uh, it should be a, uh, a, a committee or whether it should be a, an independent officer or commissioner? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Personally, uh, it seems like something that could be expanded upon the duties of the Conflict of Interest Commissioner. Um, it seems like a pretty easy extension. Um, honestly, my, my concern over some of that, though, is that it's not a situation that arises very often and that it adds a significant cost burden to the operations of the Assembly for something that doesn't really happen much. Um, that, that might be a little unwarranted, um, but perhaps that can be wrapped into the Conflict of Interest Commissioner um, position and not be a, a significant expansion. But I think having it as an outside officer of the of the House would likely um, work in the favor of, of public opinion and looking at it as, a, as, a, and as an independent decision that then, of course, needs to be reinforced in the House. And, and you know, I mean, members have to bring that decision into force, I, I assume. But um, having it done outside sort of takes away the uh, the club nature of, of everyone judging themselves. And, and I mean, for the sake of MLAs, it's, um, I would assume it's fairly challenging to uh, um, sort of judge one of your own for something that's happened um, because there's lots of other extenuating circumstances and lots of other relationships and dynamics in the house. Um, having that sort of extra burden on, on each of you is uh, probably a fairly significant one um, if that situation were to arise. Okay, thank you. Uh for your response there. Um, I know um, earlier you mentioned too this uh, uh, sort of double punishment uh, mm -hmm. concept that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, um, of course, in our review of uh, other jurisdictions, we had, we noticed that in uh, Nova Scotia and in Nunavut that there are um, um, some provisions uh, or uh, consequences perhaps if uh, someone has, uh, have been, has been convicted of a, a major criminal offense. Um, they may be prohibited from running for office. So um, just so I, we're, we're clear, you're suggesting that uh, there should be no additional um, uh, prohibitions around uh, people running for office here in the Northwest Territories beyond what's currently in place? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes. Um, I think actually the, the term may be barred from running for office is even more difficult than um, just barring someone because maybe it means it's a point for consideration each time. It means someone's judging, again, relative value of, of a crime. And I don't think that's the place of a chief elections officer or a, a committee of currently sitting MLAs. Um, there's, there's a number of pieces to that. Obviously, if you've convicted a, an election crime, one of the only things they can do to you is make you, if you've won, leave office, and if you haven't won, not run again, uh, which makes sense because there's not a lot of other punishments that specifically apply. Um, but I, you know, uh, frankly, looking around Canada, if, if the only jurisdictions are Nova Scotia and somewhat none of it, um, that's certainly not a, uh, a broad spectrum of Canada um, coming back with restrictions like that. Um, you know, I think that does occasionally lead to situations that are not favorable, but that's, I think that's, again, referring to the Charter. Um, people are, there are, there is a right in the democratic process like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, just look at my colleagues one last time. Any other questions for Mr. Wasilsi? Um Mr. Siebert? Yes, you've made your uh, position clear about um, people who have uh, served their, their time, as it were. What if they were on parole or probation? Would that make any difference? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <laughs> Please go ahead. Okay. Um, 
I, I don't think so. I mean, we're on, on it could be extended to parole or probation. Um, however, if you're, you're not incarcerated, you're capable of taking office. Um, <coughs> I fully understand a restriction if you're incarcerated, because frankly, you're incarcerated and can't take your seat in the house. And that makes uh, mountains of, of sense. It's impossible. And uh, obviously, frankly, wrong, since you're, you're now be governing a system that is in, incarcerating you. Um, but on, on parole or on probation or on conditions, um, I don't think there's necessarily that that should exclude you. I mean, you are capable of, of taking the position. You are able to, to go. And I think that some of it needs to be left with the voters. And sometimes we like to think the voters uh, always demonstrate in, infinite wisdom. Um, media opinion sometimes differs on that in different parts of the world right now. But I think that decision, that's where that decision should rest. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Wassell. you anything further, Mr. Sieber? Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, um, no, appreciate that. Um, and our legislation is clear that uh, um, you have to be uh, convicted, or you have to have be basically convicted and, and, and incarcerated to, oh. to pre prevent you or prohibit you from running or serving, <coughs> uh, continuing to serve as an MLA. So thanks. Um, Mr. Thompson, you have a question? Please go ahead. Mm, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my colleague talked about probation and conditions. Could you expand on what, how you feel about conditions? Because if you've got intermittent sentencing, which is basically on weekends, which allows you to serve, uh, is that, uh, it is a condition, so is that acceptable and will that person still be able to s sit? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Wassels, you? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Quite honestly, I hadn't given um, sort of weekend uh, sentencing uh, a lot of thought around the issue. Um, presumably, though, that means you're incarcerated, even for part of the time, which would mean that you're ineligible to be in office, because now you're, you're incarcerated, even if it's just on the weekends. Um, but I wouldn't, to me, that would hinge on, the, on what the legal definition of incarcerated would be, and that I would not have any knowledge of. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Parcells. You uh, anything further, Mr. Thompson? Oh, that's good. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so, not seeing any other questions of my colleagues. Uh, thanks again for uh, coming this evening and making a presentation. We look forward to uh, written submission, uh, and you, you could, uh, if you could, send that to uh, uh, our clerk. Um, she'll make sure that we get it and, and uh, are able to consider it. But thanks again very much uh, for coming. Thanks. We've got a couple of other people, uh, uh, Lorraine and uh, Bree. Uh, did either one of you want uh, an opportunity to talk with us? Uh, yeah, I can go ahead because we already have opportunity in your week, so I wasn't planning to, but we really sure. Go ahead. Come on up right. if you if you like. Thank you. <laughs> uh, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself uh, for. Uh, uh, the record, because we are we are taping this so that we can have a uh, an accurate record of what everybody said. But if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, that'd be great. Thank you. Hey, okay, I'm Bree Denning. I'm the executive director of the All Night Women's Society. Um, the All Night Women's Society, as a board, are intending to uh, make a written submission, um, and so we're still in discussions. And we're a consensus-based board, so we have a lot of discussing that goes on. Um, but I did wanted to speak to um, the major consideration that we keep coming across, and that's the importance of any decision and any changes that are made uh, being subjected to gender-based analysis plus. Um, as David mentioned, uh, Aboriginal men and even more so Aboriginal women are disproportionately incarcerated. And so we would want to make sure that any decisions that are made around waiting periods don't disproportionately affect our Indigenous um, community members. Um, at the same time, I absolutely agree that um, elected officials uh, should be held to a higher standard. At the same time, there are different um, backgrounds of individuals. Uh, there are different socioeconomic backgrounds. There are different availability of things like treatment options for individuals suffering from mental health and addictions. 
And so I think when people are in office, that needs to be a consideration. And so um, we're reluctant to suggest a cross-the-board response to any particular offense, just because there are so many things that need to be taken into consideration to ensure that everyone is treated um, according to what those issues that are barriers for them are. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, did you have anything further that you wanted to add? No? Okay. No. Um, I'll just look to my colleagues here to see if they have any questions. Uh, Ms. Green, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for making that point. Uh, one of the issues that has come up in the course of this hearing is um, if prior offenses are going to be adjudicated for the length of time ago they happened or their, their severity or their impact or whatever, who would do that adjudicating? What's your thought on that? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ms. Green. Uh, Ms. Denny? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I can't speak to that at the moment. I'm only really speaking to what our board has reached consensus on, but I will definitely take that back and ensure that that's a consideration that's included in our written submission. Thank you, Ms. Denning. Uh, um, Ms. Green, anything further? Um, uh, yes, thank you. Please do consider that because um, the question is, would that be in the, chief, in the office of the Chief Electoral Office? Uh, or would it be up to the Conflict of Interest Commissioner or some other person uh, to do it? And then what kind of guidelines would they be following? So um, it's, a, it's a really key point. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Green. Uh, Ms. Denning? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have nothing further. I agree. Okay. Thank you. Um, any questions from other colleagues? Um, if I could just ask, uh, you mentioned uh, the, the Gender uh, uh, Analysis Plus, and I know a few of us have actually uh, taken the, the online course. Uh, we accepted the challenge from our Minister for the Status of Women. So um, are you suggesting then that uh, before we uh, um, uh, make our final report that we uh, examine our uh, proposed recommendations with a, a view to that sort of uh, analysis first? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. I think that that should be applied pretty much across the board, and so that's definitely something that we'd like to advocate for. Okay. Well, thanks uh, very much. Uh, I would uh, suggest that you might want to put that in the, the written submission that you uh, uh, bring forward as well. That would be helpful for us. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and, and I know, Lorraine, you mentioned that the, the status of women, we, we did hear from uh, Georgina in, uh, um, in Nuvik, and uh, she indicated that they, they, uh, you might want to make a written submission with some additional points uh, before the, the deadline of December 20th. Uh, but the, I think that's up to you folks. So, um, I'll just look to my colleagues here. Uh, uh, no, I think uh, Georgina gave us uh, a, a good presentation in Inuvik. We had uh, a, a number of questions. We had a good discussion with her, and uh, um, I think she took away a few things that she was going to uh, uh, think about. And um, uh, boy, I'm just. Uh, Anamika was there as well. Anamika Mulders was there, and I think took some notes as well. So uh, I'm sure. Uh, uh, you folks will have a chance to think about some of those. The board is meeting on Thursday to make their final, all the kind of final decisions on what will go in the uh, presentation, so we should have something out to you shortly after that. Great. No, that, that'd that be really helpful. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, if there, we've heard, I think, from everybody in in the room, uh, except for Mr. McFadden, uh, but uh, he, he's not going to speak with us uh, through that that venue. So, um, but uh, once again, thank you very much for for coming. We do have, uh, I think, uh, a, a couple of possible presentations on on Friday morning, um, uh, and um, we'll, we, we'll talk about those ourselves. Uh, here uh, we'll, we'll have a bit of a, a break and the, the committee will meet uh, here to ponder some of the things that you've uh, posed. But uh, again, thank you very much for coming out this evening. Really appreciate you showing up and discussing these matters with us. So thanks. Yes. Yes, I think so. Um, 
if you folks wouldn't mind leaving the, the committee, we've got a few uh, business items that we're going to uh, talk about. Uh, but again, thanks very much for coming. And that concludes the, the meeting for this evening. Thank you.